Hello again from Concordia Theological Seminary in scenic Fort Wayne, Indiana. I'm Professor Ryan Teets, and this is our second time together in Matthew chapter 10. Now, last week, if you listened to that previous podcast, we looked at the basic nature of what happens when Jesus is on the scene. Namely, the disciples will be opposed, the apostles will have problems, but Jesus provides a message of comfort that they will be vindicated and that he cares for them. These themes in many ways continue, and one of my cautions for you, if you were to be preaching the gospel reading two Sundays in a row, and if there ever was a reason to preach the Old Testament, this may be one of them. Then again, who needs a reason to preach the Old Testament, revealing perhaps my own Old Testament bias, is that in many ways the themes really do run together here in Matthew 10, 34 to 42. Uh, issues are almost exactly the same. Although Jesus ramps up the intensity of the language and the intensity of the metaphor. We do, after all, like a gentle Jesus, meek and mild. After all, even Isaiah refers to Christ as the Prince of Peace. And in Matthew 10, starting at verse 34, this Prince of Peaceness, if you will, really does run into some problems. Jesus' kingdom at hand is so utterly shocking that it receives violent opposition and violent persecution from those who hear it. And this now becomes pretty rough in verses 34 to 39. Now, frankly, if I were to pick a text to preach on between last Sunday and this one, this is the one I would go with, because it really does capture that absolute tension of what it means to have Jesus on the scene. Oh yes, we love to think of Jesus meek and mild, oh what a friend we have in Jesus, Perhaps you may not want to pick that hymn for this coming Sunday. It may not work too well. Because Jesus looks and states pretty clearly what are the implications of him becoming. And it's shocking. We expect Jesus to bring peace. And he states, frankly, that his mission is, sta is so shocking that it will bring division and bring attacks. And this becomes a problem for the people. So much of Matthew is about a community finding its identity in Christ against opposition. If you recall in Matthew, Matthew has a pet expression, their synagogues, unique to Matthew, which implies for the original audience in Matthew that it used to be ours and we don't belong. Matthew, after all, is a gospel that is written to those who have been kicked out of their community for the sake of Christ. And that's what goes on here. There's nothing theoretical about this message, all once given to the apostles, but also given, given by Matthew to us and to his original community. For them to experience Christ, for them to have faith, means that this reality of division and hatred and the sword is something they experience on a day-to-day -day basis. Jesus on the scene means that there's going to be sharp divisions. The original communal relationships that one could count on, and we already saw this actually last Sunday as well, that you could count on fathers and sons, wives and daughters, all getting along in a communal relationship no longer applies. Instead, in this passage, Jesus redefines community. And that's the major thrust here that I would emphasize in this part of Matthew 10, especially if you're trying to preach Matthew 10 two Sundays in a row. The issue becomes one of who belongs to the, what does it mean to belong to Christ? And part of it means that one belongs to a new community that has been newly redefined. Uh, this is stated especially, in, especially at the tail end of this, of this passage, in which one is initially called to reject a uh, father and mother if oh if they are if their love is more than if your love for them is more than Christ, which implies that the new community formed in the body of Christ with Christ as its head becomes the defining community for God's people. A part of this is the paradox of suffering, the idea of hanging of taking up one's cross, of embracing persecution, and when we talk about taking up one's cross, we need to be a little careful here. Uh, it's so easy to make cross-bearing almost into a cliché that trivializes it. Uh, my cross is that 
uh, today we don't have air conditioning in the studio which I'm recording from. And that's not, while true, it's not actually the paradox, what it means to take up one's cross. To take up one's cross is to embrace public shame, humility, and suffering because of Christ. And that's what Christ calls us to do. He calls us to do this knowing that we belong to a community where word and sacrament is present. And he calls us to take up our cross knowing that our eventual vindication will happen. And that's really where 40 onward, the tail end of this pericope, goes. The idea that whoever receives him, whoever, that whoever, rec whoever receives a righteous person receives a righteous reward. In other words, that the hope and the vindication is near. Oh, suffering happens, but suffering happens for the sake of Christ. Oh, suffering happens, but Christ gives us a new community that trumps our old communal relations. Oh, suffering does happen, and Christ gives us the promise of the reward in the age to come. To which we say, come Lord Jesus, and to which I say to you, may God bless you as you preach upon this text. In Jesus' name, amen.